we're not big down the road. And uh, so I told my wife, first wife, uh, Susan, who's deceased now, I said, you know, I'm going to be the informant until I were. I left, and right after I left, the informant called the house and said, uh, there's Merle there. She said, no, he's gone. I said, get a hold of him and tell him to set up. They're going to kill him. And so she went crazy and called the highway patrol. They couldn't raise me because that day my police radio went out. And I was alone. I got there at the Horn Lake exit. Not one was waiting for me, but two. I should have driven off and, and later Jim Clemente at Criminal Minds in Hollywood, who now backs us in Hollywood, former FBI agent. He said, what were you thinking? <laughs> you know, why didn't you drive? What were you thinking? And I said, well, I was young, you know, I thought I was bulletproof. And I let him get in my car, which was really a dumb thing to do. And pretty, I won't tell you all what happened. It deteriorated quickly. I realized who they were and why they had come. And it came to the point where everybody was holding their guns. Mm -hmm. you go first. <laughs> and uh, so the guy got me out of that, and then I became later supervisor and captain over the uh, North Half of State. And uh, uh, we were doing a heroin deal, a heroin dealer. We borrowed from several times, agents had, they were flooding the Golden Triangle, uh, Mississippi State, MSCW area, high grade, highly addictive heroin to create a heroin market, an addict market. And so we were going to do one last big deal. Uh, we couldn't let that money walk away be so much money. We were going to draw out there backwards. So we had that deal set up on a cold Sunday morning, 40 years ago, next month. Sunday afternoon, sorry, next month. And uh, I was in Tupelo, the office I went to, and then and I was running down, to, you know, jumped in my car, run down to meet the agents and start with to set up the parameters of the deal. Jumped in my car, cranked up, put my hand on the gear shift. When I did, the spirit just filled up my car. Rubbed all around me, all through me. I've never experienced anything like that in my life. It scared me. Mm -hmm. it scared me. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just, I mean, it, I think it was massaging every molecule in my body. And uh, it clearly said to me, go back and get the bulletproof vest. Then it was gone. And, uh, and I said, well, what is that? I'm losing my mind. You know, and the agents didn't like to wear bulletproof vests in those days. Uh, no one did much, not like now. And we only had two for the north half of the state, and they had no armor in them. And it would stop maybe a small handgun. And uh, agents didn't like to wear them in hard to conceal. So I don't know where that came from. I put my hand back on the gear shift. Spirit came right back in my car, wrapped all around me, all through me. It wasn't optional this time. Go back in the vest. So I said, okay. I got the vest and I met with the agents, and I you can understand I was quite nervous about what was going on. I was unfolding, and I uh, said, so I want y'all to wear the vest if you want to. And I said, No, he or me, don't ask me why. I knew they weren't ready to receive it. I'm not sure, I wasn't sure I was. And uh, uh, so we, I said, Keep it in town, downtown Columbus, so we'll have buildings to hide the house where we stay close to. You know, it's hard out in the country, you know, where you can look down and one side of the lake. Who are those guys a quarter mile down the road? Why are they here? Who are they? And so I said, keep it in town. Well, it got away from it. It went out south of town on this road. It wound around. It came up on this high bank. And uh, this levee. And there was deep depression on either side, you know, leading off into a swampy area. And right up here, a big railroad came across and intersected with a little road on top of the levee. And so in that depression was a high railroad trestle. And right past that railroad trestle, where it's going into the road, was a clump of pine trees. And that's where they had the sniper. The sniper was posted up there with the high fire gravel. And when the agents began to do the deal, uh, you know, we were here cutting in and out of body lights that I, I put on the agents so we could listen. And, and we heard them negotiating, negotiating, and then State narcotics, you're under arrest, and then it went out. And it popped back on, and it would be heard ta 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 ta. Gunfire erupted. And then the radio erupted, and they said, Merle, that they're taking fire, they're taking fire. And um, we came across the levee, and there was just gun smoke hanging in the cold air. There was a storm rolling in that night that froze everything from Jackson to Corinth, the sheet of ice. And the rolling charcoal clouds like I've never seen before. And like they're trying to squeeze all the light out of the earth. And it was just the intersection of heaven and hell that day. It was a nightmare of horror. And uh, everybody firing. And uh, we were caught in the crossfire coming across the levee. Uh, the female agent radioed against the Merle Jerry. The agents hit back.
that. He was hit three times. And she had just shot the other violator who went in to throw his weapon out. She shot him and he was drawing out through the wrist. And uh, she said, I'm going to try to get him to the hospital. She took off. Finally, we secured the scene, the sniper, and the other violator fled off into the swamp. And I went to the hospital, walked in, tried to comfort her, and she was 20 by 21, just seen her partner shot no multiple times and shot her first person. And uh, then I walked in and arrested the violator. She had wanted to come there for treatment. And I walked into the ER, and when I walked into the ER, they were cutting the clothes off the our friend and agent, the agent who was hit. And there was that white bulletproof vest that the Lord had sent me back again. And it was crimson soaked in blood. And the doctor said, well, I look at this. And one round hit him in his lower extremity, one slice through his arm. This one hit him right in the chest. He said it penetrated the vest, and it wasn't designed to stop a high fire drop, but it deflected it. Hmm. So it went in behind his right breast, skittered around the barrel of his rib cage, popped out behind his left breast. I get cold chills right now, it's been 40 years. And he looked at me and said, Merle, Ben had that vest on, taking out his heart and lungs, he had been dead before he hit the ground. Mm. I'm telling you, you can hear a shuffle of angels feet around us saying, you can hear that murmur, that murmur, that still, small, still voice. And I couldn't quite get that. That was coming more and more into focus of my life. And I, I knew that we were not alone, and I was not alone. I still didn't understand it. So I doubled down on my workspace salvation <laughs> and, uh, and, and not knowing that that's not what it's all about. And, um, you know, after that, I was uh, asked to investigate a corrupt governor who was trying to corrupt our agency. Somebody had forced in and uh, had abused a lot of young women. And I had to go out and interview them about very painful things in two or three different states. And that was very painful. And, uh, uh, and, and the governor's office tampered with one of my witnesses. They called <coughs> one of my witnesses in Memphis, and she wouldn't talk to me anymore. And I had, I had to call Jackson and threaten to resign. I said, you know, this stops or I'll resign today, and I'll be able to press for here to young, everything I got. And the governor was getting ready to run uh, for Senate, so he didn't want that, so they agreed to, to back off. And we won that battle, but then, you know, they called me from Jackson and told me they're coming after you. They're going to knock that halo off your head because everybody likes you, the press likes you, so they, so they can come after you. And uh, you may wonder if that happens. It happens all the time. It still happens today. Uh, the people in government have immense power to mm. punish their political enemies. Mm. And uh, one thing they do is they put something in your report, or, or either they'll have a friendly government employee somewhere, and there are some in the police body who will stop you out on the highway for supposedly speeding or something, and they'll pop you upside the head with a blackjack and pour a little whiskey on you and throw you in the drunk tank. And it'll be on the front page of the paper of the corporate press. You know, this is, uh, you know, look at this. He's not the, you know, the great hero that you thought he was. And, uh, and it, no matter if you're with it, that'll be on page four. So many things happen on the North Pole in your lane. I can tell you so many stories that are in books, in, in the trilogy of books, especially in book three and Redeem, covers that whole period. And, and in the midst of all of that, uh, uh, the Lord kept showing me, he said, I have good things waiting for you. You know, hang on, hang on. And every time I want to give up, he sends somebody to me whose life is being transformed by our ministry or something. And then he sent Judy to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, Judy and I had known each other in high school and I uh, rode a single school bus. And my first wife and I, Susan, uh, Susan and I were in uh, Judy's wedding in 1970, a four person wedding, four of us at a JP. I was the best man in photography. <laughs> and Jerry, her husband, passed away the same year as Susan did. So Judy just came to see me as a friend and give me comfort, and right away the Lord showed us. You know, no, you know, I have, you know, other things in mind to you. And uh, so in 2010, we were married in Millington in the visiting room up there, and uh, 
I'll tell everybody now, you know, I've been in both of Judy's weddings. I'm the best man, the bestest man. <laughs> and uh, so Judy and I went out on the road, uh, sharing our testimony, going to Hollywood, signed the cast a couple of lines of major crimes, been on Israel National Radio, KPLA, the largest Christian radio station in America, American Family Radio. Uh, had two hour private lunch with Robbie Zacharias, a great Christian apologist of our time, and John Paul Robbie in Atlanta with his wife and read my first book. Uh, schools have picked him up, they're using them. Uh, the first book, Ghost of Shady Pale, is um, the all time best selling novel in the history of the Barnes and Noble story, Two Below. I never would have dreamed any of that. It's not me, it's all God. And he's opened every door that everybody said couldn't be open. So it's, uh, you know, I got lost. Uh, in life and uh, you know for a while and uh, got lost in those dark woods but there you know the Lord took my hand he led me out you know to the other side and when I came out on the other side uh, oh God you know I was taller than the trees and I could see all the way you know from the drug wars uh, uh, in the old days to the political wars to prison and right here at the United Methodist Church here in the surf. And, uh, you know, it's been a long journey, and it's something I want to share with you. It's something that I, that I preached at, that at a turning point in my life inside uh, a memorial for the death of one of our friends inside. You know, about, uh, you know, when you're going through that darkness and you're down in the valley. And uh, last night, you know, they buried the rose in the garden. The fragrance of sorrow hung thick in the air. Satan was breathing a sigh of relief. The disciples were hiding, defeated, and grieving. But this morning, the rose blooms in the garden. Fragrance of victory fills the air. Last night, there was weeping with no consolation. But this morning, rejoicing in the God of salvation. Today, there is hope in the morning light. What a difference God made between now and last night. You know, I know that I'm confident one day that I'm going to see Susan and Claude and Lane again one day. And, you know, and I can't wait. And I tell you all, if I stand here today, despite everything that's happened to me in my life, you know, I, I, uh, you know, I got nothing I asked for in life, but I got everything that I could have hoped for. Mm. And I, I'm our man, I count myself most blessed. Thank you, God bless you. Mm.